All right, folks, we're about ready to get started here. Uh, I'm Alan Alcorn, the uh, president of the Falcon Football Club, and uh, we certainly appreciate everybody's presence here tonight, and uh, I think you're in for a treat. Um, I've been uh, fortunate enough to spend a little time with Mr. Peter McDonald and his daughter, Charity, today, and, and um, I think you're really going to enjoy it. A um, couple of housekeeping items, um, emergency exits, obviously, the, in the rear of the auditorium. There are restrooms, if you go out the way you came in, down the hall on the right, can't miss them. And we would also like to ask it that you silence your cell phones or any other electronic devices that you may have. And also, we want to recognize all of our sponsors. There's been several folks that uh, have been, uh, take, took part in uh, making this possible, and uh, we certainly want to recognize them at this time. Uh, first and foremost is Bank of Lincoln County. We appreciate all that you all have done, uh, the hosting the reception this evening. Uh, Landers McClarty Toyota, ADC, Shoney's, Howard Bentley Buick Pontiac GMC, Los Trojas Mexican Restaurant, Lincoln County Officials, Higgins Funeral Home, In Designs, and Horton Printing. And again, like I said, there are several other folks that were involved. I'm not going to even try to name them all, uh, but we certainly appreciate every, everybody that was took part. Um, the order of uh, events tonight, Mr. Peter McDonald, Sr., the Navajo Code Talker, is going to come and give his presentation. And then afterwards, we're going to have a question and answer session. And if you want to ask a question, um, I, I think the best way to do that is, is maybe come down closer to the front. And if you, right now, if you're having trouble hearing me or the sound is not good where you're at or you've got a disability of some sort, we've got a few seats still available that's reserved on the front row. Feel free to move down to that if, if you're having trouble hearing or seeing. Um, he does have a book um, it's titled Navajo Weapon. He has a few that's available for sale tonight that after his presentation and after the question and answer session, you can make your way to this corner of the stage and uh, form a line here and come up at the table. He'll autograph it, you know, personalize it for you. They are $40. He will accept cash, check, or credit card. And he also has some postcards that he'll sell and sign for you. They are $5. And um, we also have, as you noticed when we, you came in, uh, DVD. Um, you can place an order for DVDs that we're filming the event. And you're certainly welcome to go if you have not already ordered one. Uh, back out the way you came in, uh, see the ladies at the table, and, and they'll sign you up and get your name and address and money. Um, and in just a moment, before I get into the uh, Mr. Peter McDonald's bio, I'm going to ask Mr. Jim Black, minister of the Washington Street Church of Christ here in Federal, to come and uh, lead a prayer over our nation and our military and our veterans. So, Jim, if you don't mind doing that. As we pray, we can't help uh, in our nation but think about uh, the significance of this week, uh, this week being uh, uh, the opportunity that we've seen on television to uh, bury a president and also tomorrow being December the 7th to recognize the significance of, uh, uh, of the beginning of a world war. And uh, so we'll pray over our uh, servants who are serving in our milita military and over uh, Mr. McDonald tonight. Bow with us in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessings that you have given us. And Father, not the least of which is uh, the blessing of living in uh, this great nation. Father, you have uh, blessed us in so many ways. And Father, we thank you for each and every one who has answered the call of service to our country. Uh, and we thank you for, uh, for their sacrifice, for their willingness to put themselves in harm's way. Folks like Mr. McDonald who have served our country. Father, we pray your blessings over those who are currently serving. And Father, we pray for safety. We pray for peace. Father, we pray for our country that you would always guide and lead those who are serving in leadership positions. And Father, we pray that the, your blessings could continue. Father, we pray your blessings on this evening as we hear from one of these great servants. And we pray uh, this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jim. All right, at this time, I'm going to introduce Mr. Peter McDonald. Um, his daughter, Charity, is here with him as well. Uh, they come from the Navajo Reservation in Cuba City, Arizona. Uh, Mr. McDonald is married to his wife, Wanda. They have uh, five children and nine grandchildren. 
He is the uh, current president of the Navajo Code Talkers Association, and he's a former four-term chairman of the Navajo Nation, and he enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps at age 15. Uh, he has an earned an electrical engineering degree from the University of Oklahoma. He is the recipient of the Congressional Silver Medal for Heroic Services to the Nation. He received special commendation by President Richard Nixon for exceptional service to others. And he's raising funds for the uh, Navajo, um, National Navajo Code Talkers Museum and Veterans Center to honor the heroes of World War II. And I'm sure he'll talk more about that um, in his presentation. So please help me welcome Mr. Peter McDonald, Sr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of Fayetteville and from other places. This is such a wonderful crowd here, standing room only. I'm very, very happy, my daughter and I, to be here this evening to witness a community that works together for the good of the community, for the good of the children, because they are our future. And I was very happy to meet them. I want to thank Ellen and others whom I've met earlier, given their time to make something happen good for the Falcons. <laughs> Let's give them all a good round of applause for doing that. <laughs> and give yourself a good round of applause because you have such a wonderful community here. <laughs> this very much reminds me of the community that we had on Navajo Nation back in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. We all worked together to make our community a good community and also having the welfare and the future of our children in mind. And that's exactly what you are doing here in this small community. So I'm very happy to be here this evening to share some of the experience that I had with United States Marine Corps as a member of the Navajo Code Talkers. First of all, in Navajo, the usual introduction is to state your clans. My Maternal clan is Hashkahan Tsoho, and my paternal clan is Batani. And I'm here this evening to give you a brief talk on what the Navajo Code Talkers were all about. You know, during the early part of World War II, shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. As a matter of fact, 77 years ago, this day, the Japanese were just a few hundred miles outside of Pearl Harbor. Tomorrow, on the 7th, they moved in. And you all know what happened. 77 years ago. Today, I'm here to tell you just a brief story of how United States fought back in the Pacific to regain 
the freedom as well as liberty that we all cherish. Shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States was getting ready to fight back in the Pacific. Not too long, they ran into one big problem. The problem was communication. You know, they tell us that in any war, no matter how far back you go, whichever site that has the best communication normally has the advantage in the war. That's what they tell us. And in our case in the Pacific, the enemy had the advantage. Why? Because they were breaking every military code that was being used in the Pacific. Military code used by Marines, Navy, Army, and the Air Force. So, because of that, strategizing in this huge Pacific area became very, very difficult because the enemy is breaking codes. And also, this huge Pacific area, it takes days, sometimes even weeks, to go from point A to point B. So the enemy had all that time to break the code. And when they break the code, they know exactly where you're going to be, what day, what time, and what location. And they would be there with their submarine, blow up your shipment of supplies, equipment, and personnel. Very tough to strategize without the enemy knowing where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. This became public knowledge in January of 1942, a few weeks after bombing of Pearl Harbor. A gentleman by the name of Philip Johnston was working near San Diego. When he learned of this situation, he went over to the United States Marine Corps base and talked with the Marine Corps communication officers. Philip Johnston suggested why not use Navajo language as a code. The enemy doesn't know Navajo language. Well, the Marines really didn't know what he was talking about because they never heard of Navajos. So, Philip Johnson took it upon himself to come to the reservation Pick up four Navajos, took them down to San Diego to demonstrate what he was talking about. They put two Navajos on one end of the building with a radio headset and the other two on the other end. They gave these two a message written in English to send that message in Navajo to the other two. They compared the two messages. The one that was sent, the one that was received. And they look similar, but not necessarily alike. So, Marine Corps decided this looks like it has some possibilities. So they asked the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps in Washington, D.C., permission to try this suggestion made by Philip Johnston. Philip Johnston was not a Navajo. His parents came to the Navajo Nation late 1800 as missionaries to Navajo. So Philip Johnston grew up on a Navajo reservation, playing with Navajo kids, learned the language, and he also served in the United States Army during World War I with a communication unit in Europe. So Philip Johnston knows something about communication. 
Philip Johnson also knows quite a bit about Navajo, knows the language. He's the one making this suggestion. Why not use Navajo language as a code? Well, it was up to the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, Washington, D.C. When we received requests to do this, the first answer coming from the Commandant was, no, don't do that. We don't know these Indians, he said. <laughs> All we know is what we see in the movies. When they see a wagon train, they yell and holler right around that wagon train, shooting arrows. This is not that kind of a war, so leave it alone. Number two, the Commandant also said, the Marine Corps is a very proud organization. We don't want anyone wearing the United States Marine Corps uniform that might embarrass this proud organization. Just do the best you can. Well, the enemy continued to break codes. The enemy continued to move in our direction real fast, taking strategic islands that we need in order to get close to their homeland, like Guam, Wake Island, moving in our direction real fast. More pressure on the Commandant. We need code that the enemy would not understand. Eventually, the Commandant said, OK. Now, initial request was made in February 1942. Now in April of 1942, when the Commandant finally said, OK. But you've got to do it my way, he said. Every military code is top secret. So the project of using Navajo language as a code must be top secret. No one should know what you are doing, except those who have a right to know. That was the Commandant's number one suggestion, top secret operation. Number two. The Commandant said, only recruit 30 young Navajos. Don't tell them what you're going to do with them. Just ask them if they want to fight. Shoot the enemy with rifles, not arrows. <laughs> also, <clears throat> make sure that they can become United States Marines. All just ask them if they want to fight, if they want to join Marines, that's all. Nothing about the code. Because we need to find out if they truly can become United States Marines. Thirdly, go to the Navajo Nation, ask permission to use the language. Now we are talking as I said, April of 1942. With that authorization, the United States Marine Corps Communication Unit of San Diego came out to the Navajo Nation with Philip Johnston as a guide to recruit 30 young Navajos not telling them what they are being recruited for. They were just asked, you want to fight the Japanese? You want to shoot the enemy? You want to wear a nice blue Marine Corps uniform like this? Come join the Marines. That was the only information they were given. So these 30 young Navajos volunteered. Oh yeah, I want to Join the Marines, I want to fight the enemy. They were given a preliminary physical exam. All of these 30 young Navajos were going to federally operated boarding schools. 
operated by the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs. They got 30 to volunteer. They gave them preliminary physical exam. One dropped out, so there was only 29. These 29 young Navajos were then put on a bus taken down to San Diego Marine Corps base. There were several units going through boot camp. The 29 young Navajos made into one platoon. All these other platoons were going through boot camp all together. Now we're talking May of 1942. After graduation from boot camp at San Diego, each platoon going through boot camp were graded. See how well they did. Navajo platoon came in number one of all other platoons going through boot camp. This went back to the Commandant. Thank you. Of course, the Commandant was very happy. He says, terrific, wonderful. Now process them through combat training and see what they do. You see what the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps really didn't know? How we lived back in those days. It was not unusual for any one of us to put in 10 to 15 miles every day on reservation back in those times. Tending to livestock that we all had. 1,000, 1,500 had a sheep, 500 or more cows, about 30 horses, farm, all of us working together to manage that. We get up before sun up, take the animals out. We're told to take them out to a nice green pasture. When you do, stay out there with them, whether it's raining, snowing, wind blowing, sun beating down on you, you stay out there with the animals. Overnight, two nights if necessary. So we carry a blanket, take the animals out before sun up to a nice green pasture. When they settle down, start crazy good, you sit down, watch them. Make sure coyotes don't come sneaking in on the herd. Stay overnight, you carry a blanket. One of us would be carrying a 22 rifle. When you get hungry, you shoot a rabbit, barbecue, that's your meal for the day. So, to these 29 young Navajos going through boot camp, was like a vacation. <laughs> oh my God, a bed to sleep on, with mattress, nice clean sheets, Pillows. We didn't know there was such a thing as pillows until we got to San Diego. Also, you don't have to carry a 22 rifle to get something to eat. Just get in a chow line. Three meals a day. What a life. That's why they came in number one going through boot camp. The same thing happened with combat training. Every one of them came out of that combat training, sharpshooters or experts on weapons that were being used at that time. After that, these 29 young Navajos were processed through Marine Corps Communication School, where they taught us Navy semaphore signals, also Morse code, they don't use Morse code anymore, but if you see a class B movie, you'll see it. A train comes into a train depot. Inside that train depot, there's an old man with a green bill sitting there tapping on something. 
going like da 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 that's Morse code. That was one of the code systems that was used at that They taught him that. Also, how to string telephone lines from coconut trees to coconut trees. How to make minor repairs of all the different communication equipment being used at that time. All of this. The 29 young Navajos. Now we're talking June of 1942. Pass all of this. They were then separated from the rest of the Marine Corps, put on a bus. United States Marine Corps Colonel took them down to San Diego, east side of San Diego, a place called Camp Elliott, to a building about the size of this hall here with high fence all around it and a gate at the gate, two guards. Over the gate, there's a big sign that said, keep out, top secret operation. <laughs> Through that gate, the colonel processed these 29 young Navajos into a classroom, the normal classroom size. In that classroom were tables with four chairs. In front of each chair, writing tablet, pencil, a blackboard, chalk and eraser. United States Marine Corps Colonel then told these 29 young Navajos, gentlemen, you are Marines now. You're ready to go fight the enemy. But before you do that, we'd like for you to develop a military code using your language. Now, this is the first time these 29 young Navajos learned that they were recruited to develop a military code using the Navajo language. What a surprise. I'm sure if you're one of them, we would look at each other and say, what in the world did we get ourselves into here? <laughs> we joined Marines to fight and here we are sitting in a top secret classroom. The colonel emphasized the secrecy of the project. He told them that everything you do in this classroom is top secret. You are not to take anything out of this classroom, out the gate back to your barracks. You are not to tell anyone outside this classroom what you are doing here. No one knows. This is a top secret operation. Also, the code that we would like for you to develop in your language must be subject to memory only. You cannot write it down, carry it around in your pocket, especially when you go out into combat. If you get shot, the enemy retrieves that note from you and they'll have a way of breaking your code. So, everything stays in the classroom. Whatever you create as a code must be subject to memory only. Thirdly, whatever code you develop in your language, only you in this top secret classroom should know what those code words represent. Another Navajo, not in this top secret classroom, here you use the code words you are developing, should have no idea what in the world you are talking about when you start using it. That's the kind of code we want. Lecture of how the code should be developed, how it is that it's a top secret operation. Eventually, the colonel then said, here's a box full of sample military messages. 
look at it, read it, and see how you can develop how you can develop a code to send messages like this. Using the code words you can be developing. Colonel sat down, lit his pipe, and said, Go to work, gentlemen. What do you do if you're one of the 29? You join to fight the war, to shoot the enemy. Here we are sitting in the classroom being told, do something that's top secret, no one should know. Well, like all good Marines, these 29 young Navajos went to work, went through the sample messages in the box. They were all written in the English language, using the English alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F. This presented the first big problem for these 29 young Navajos. Now, we're talking June of 1942, just east side of San Diego. Why was it a problem? Navajo is not a written language. Therefore, we don't have Navajo words for letters like A, B, C, D, E, F. How in the world are you going to send something you don't even have words for? So they talk about it. One of the 29 young men went to the blackboard and wrote down a big letter A and said, since only we in this top secret classroom would know what these code words represent. Let's call the letter A, Belasana. Belasana in Navajo means apple. Okay, they wrote it down in their notepad. A equals Belasana or apple. What shall we call the letter B? After talking about it, they decided to call the letter B shush. Shush in Navajo means bear. Okay, so they all agreed. B equals shush or bear. How about letter C? Masse. Masse in Navajo means cat. Letter D, B. B in Navajo means deer. D-E-E-R. You see what they were doing? They were selecting Navajo words that they are very familiar with on the reservation. Easy to remember. Apple, bear, cat, deer. Things that they see all the time on the reservation. Easy to remember. Down the line, each letter of the English alphabet getting Navajo code words. Some letters they had difficulty agreeing what to call, like the letter J. Eventually they all agreed to call the letter J Telechoki. Telechoki in Navajo means jackass. Easy to remember. We had a lot of jackasses on the Navajo reservation. We used them to hold wood, water, and even manage the animals that we were charged with. All the way down to the letter Z. Code word for letter Z, Beshtotlish. Beshtotlish in Navajo means zinc. We had zinc on Navajo, very familiar with it. So now, in their notepad, they have developed Navajo code words for each letters of the English alphabet. And only they, the 29 in their top secret classroom, know what those Navajo words represent. If another Navajo hear them say, Belasana, they think we're talking about apple, something you eat.
But if you're a coat topper, when you hear Belasana, you don't write apple, you write down the letter A. There were quite a few military terms that no Navajo words for. La hand grenade. We never seen hand grenade until we got to San Diego. So what was the code word developed for a hand grenade? No masi. No masi in Navajo means potato. Hand grenade looks like a potato. All the ships that exist. We never knew these ships exist on Navajo because Navajo is a dry country, no water. Until we got to San Diego, they said there's huge steel structure, that's a battleship, that's a cruiser, that's a destroyer, and that's an aircraft carrier, and that down there is a submarine. We had to create code words for it. What was the code word for a battleship? So, 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 so in Navajo means big fish. <laughs> How about the code word for cruiser? So, so, yaja, little big fish. <laughs> How about aircraft carrier? City ne yehe. City ne yehe in Navajo means one that carry birds. Submarine, fish law. Fish law in Navajo means armed fish. They're writing it down on their tablets, memorizing it every day, creating code words from sunup to sundown, east side of San Diego, top secret location. Every day after they finish work, before they go back out the gate, search from your toes to the top of your head making sure you don't take any of these notes back out to the barracks. Every Friday there would be a test on the code words that are created and memorized. The group will be divided into two, Group A and Group B. Group A is given a message containing all the code words that are developed, sent to Group B. They write it down. They compare the two messages, the one that was sent, the one that was received. To see these, the messages are beginning to look exactly alike. Every Friday test, all through the month of June, 1942, into July of 1942. Toward the end of July, 1942, 260 code words were developed by this first group of Navajos, 29 of them. Final test, group A, group B. Group A is given a, a long message containing those 260 code words developed and memorized, sent to group B. Group B wrote it down, they compared the two messages. But golly, they look exactly alike, with one exception, punctuation marks. Back to the classroom <laughs> to create code words for punctuation marks. A period, no problem, dafligen. Dafligen in Navajo means a black dot. Semicolon took a little time to create code word for it. But eventually, some of colon was called Dathlijim Betzeh, not dead. Dathlijim Betzeh, not dead in Navajo means a black duck that lost its tail. <laughs> that would be the code word for some of colon. Question mark, a jaw. A jaw in Navajo means ears, because question mark looks like an ear. Every punctuation mark you could think of Code words were developed, written down, memorized. Final test, toward the end of July, 1942. Group A, Group B. Group A is given a message containing all of these 260 code words and all punctuation marks they could think of, sent to Group B. Group B wrote it down. They compared the two messages. 
By golly, it's exactly alike. As a matter of fact, it looks like a Xerox copy of the one that was sent. At this juncture, the, Colon the Colonel, United States Marine Corps Colonel said, gentlemen, we're finished here now. We can test this coat you just developed in actual battle to see how your memory works under enemy fire. August 7, 1942, First Marine Division landed on the island of Guadalcanal, the first landing in the Pacific. First Marine Division. Thirteen of these 29 young Navajos that just developed this new code were sent overseas to join the First Marine Division to test the code under enemy fire. Eight weeks after the landing on Guadalcanal, General Vandegriff, commander of the 1st Marine Division, sent word back to the United States, said, this Navajo code is terrific. The enemy never understood it, he said. We don't understand it either, he said. <laughs> But it works. Send us some more Navajos. That went back to the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps in Washington, D.C. Of course, he was very happy and ordered San Diego Marine Corps Base to take charge of this new coat that was just developed, meaning to start recruiting Navajos using the same method don't tell them what you're going to do with them. Just ask them if they want to join the Marines. Ask them if they want to shoot the enemy. Ask them if they like to wear this nice blue Marine Corps uniform. And if they say yes, recruit them just like you do all other Marines. That's how this code was developed, tested on the island of Guadalcanal, passed test and became official United States military code for the remainder of the war in the Pacific. After Guadalcanal, all the other landings like Bougainville, Cape Cluster, New Britain, Tarawa, Macon, Kowachalan, Inuitok, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Haosan, Guam. After Guam, Peleliu, very bad island. After Peleliu, Iwo Jima, another bad one. After Iwo, Okinawa, another bad one. After Okinawa, some of us were sent into North China to get those Japanese soldiers in Manchuria who refused to surrender, to surrender. They eventually did. October 25, 1945, we had a separate peace treaty ceremony with the close to a million Japanese soldiers in Manchuria at Tsingtao, China. All through these battles, Navajo Code was used after it became official United States military code to be treated, protected, just like all other military codes that were being used at that time. How is it done? Every landing, Marine Corps and Navy establishes two communication networks. Never hold communication network for all top secret confidential messages. Messages you don't want the enemy to know goes through Never hold communication network. The second communication network was English for all other messages. Messages you don't care if the enemy breaks the code or the enemy understands what you're talking about goes through English network.
These two communication networks, Navajo and English, work side by side everywhere. The front line, breach command post, into the command ship. Usually command ship is a battleship. In the communication room of the battleship, there are two tables. Around one table sits Navajo code talkers with message pads to receive and send top secret confidential messages. Messages you don't want the enemy to know goes through a Navajo network. How was it done? Navy assigns us runners to stand behind each one of us. Right after the first fire is shot on the island. And these runners stand behind us 24 hours a day until the island is secured. When messages start coming in in Navajo code, we write it down in English, hand it over our shoulder to the runner. He takes it up to the bridge, gives it to the general or the admiral, directing the operation on the landing. They read it, they respond. The runner brings it back down. If it says Arizona, New Mexico on top of that message, we, the code talkers, send that message back out in Navajo code. But if it doesn't say that, there's another table right next to us. Around that table sits blonde haired guys. They send that message out in English code. These two communication networks work side by side. Every battle from Guadalcanal all the way through Okinawa, North China. It worked beautifully. The enemy never broke the code. They tried to break the Navajo code. They couldn't do it. That's how the code was developed. That's how it was used in actual battle. Well, starting with 29 young Navajos in 1942, by the time the war ended, there were over 400 of us certified as Navajo code talkers. Went through that same top secret location, learned the code words, sent overseas. Also, in 1942, there was only one Marine Division, 1st Marine Division. By the time the war ended, there were six Marine Divisions. And each division were allocated at least 80 Navajo code talkers to provide that top secret confidential communication network for that division. So whichever division that's going to do the landing, code talkers within that division provide that top secret confidential communication network. Like on Iwo Jima, three Marine divisions landed, third, fourth, and fifth. So there's about 80 code talkers in each division. Multiply 80 by three, over 200 Navajo code talkers participated in the, on the Battle of Iwo Jima. How does it sound? Well, let's go to Iwo Jima, because it's most familiar to everybody. That island on the south side is Mount Sarabachi. In the middle is an airstrip. On the north side, some little hills. A company of Marines was pinned down Ray of Bagley on the north side. Can't get out. They were being fired upon from three major directions. Motor shells were being dropped on them. They were desperately hunkering down in their foxhole. Can't move. Looks like this is the end. Company commander scribbled a message, gave it to Navajo code talker covering 
that particular company on the front line, asking him to send that message to Beach Command Post, asking for help. What did he say when he got the message? Well, the message was written in English for sure, but he sent that message to Beach Command Post. At Beach Command Post, there's usually about five or six code talkers as well, receiving and sending confidential top secret messages. Well, the code talker covering this, this company that was pinned down sent the message. And this is what he said. By the way, this message was the actual message that was sent on Iwo. A copy of it is the Marine Corps archives in Washington, D.C. This is what the code talker said. The best anna achi bi daki trahi de na son se traji ta chen ki da tsa tra astra na ki shash. I know you didn't understand what I said. <laughs> but let's say that that message was broadcast to the Navajos on the reservation. What, these, what would the Navajos hear this code talker say in Navajo asking for help? This is exactly what the Navajos would have heard this code talker say asking for help. Sheep, eyes, nose, deer, destroyer, tea, mouse, turkey, onion, sit horse, three, six, two, bear. Navajos don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Just a bunch of Navajo words. Sheep, eyes, nose, deer, sick horse, what in the world is that? The code talker down at the beach command post receiving this message. As each never whole words comes through, he writes it down in English. What did he write down? Sheep, eyes, nose, deer, sick horse? No. He wrote down, send demolition team to hill 362B. There's three hills on the north side. 362A, 362B, 362C. Beneath 362B was the problem. This nav message, Navajo message, in code, took 20 seconds. After 20 seconds, help was on the way. Tanks with flamethrowers and other heavy unit was sent out there to save that company Marines. If that same message was sent in the English code, 30 minutes, the same message, 20 seconds in Navajo, 30 minutes in English. Why 30 minutes and just 20 seconds in Navajo? If you're gonna send something in English code and you don't want the enemy to know, you scramble it first. How do you do that? Besides carrying our radio, we also have another unit called scrambling and descrambling machine. If you want to send something in English code, you want to scramble it. How do you do that? You take the message that's given to you to send. Take the first letter of that message, feed it into your scrambling machine. Press the button, take the next letter of that message, feed it into your scrambling machine. Press the button, one letter at a time, all through the message. When you finish, you press the big button, and out comes that message, scramble. Scramble messages came in groups of five letters, like K-Z-T-I-O, another group of five. That's the one you sent over the air. Scramble message. The English network guy writes it down. 
that message in scramble form. He turns off his radio, turn on his de-scrambling machine. Take the first letter of that scramble message, feed it into your de-scrambling machine, press a button. Take the next letter, feed it into your de-scrambling machine, press a button. All day long, taking one letter at a time, until you finish with the scramble message, you press the big button, and out comes that message unscrambled. Hopefully, exactly the way it was sent, because there's too many pressing buttons going on both sides. Sometimes, you press the wrong button. 30 minutes doing that, versus 20 seconds in Navajo. Those guys didn't have 30 minutes. That's why Navy and Marine really loved Navajo code because it was fast, it was secure. They tell us it's the only military message, no, the only military code in modern history never broken, Navajo code. Save hundreds of thousands of lives in the Pacific. Also helped win the war in the Pacific. The code was so good that when the war ended in 1945, we, the Navajo Code Talkers, were told, don't tell anyone what you did in war. If you're being asked, what did you do in the war by your parents, relatives, or anyone? Just tell them you're a radio man, that's all, nothing more. You wait until the code is declassified before you tell anyone what you did. So, upon discharge from the United States Marine Corps in 1945 and 46, but came home, sure enough, relatives, brothers and sisters say, hey, what did you do in the war? How many enemy did you kill? And all those crazy questions. All we could say was, I'm sorry, I was just a radio man, don't ask me any more questions. We were told to keep saying that until the code was declassified. So we're waiting to hear that the Navajo Code was declassified, official military code. We waited and waited and waited. Finally, we just forgot about it. 1968, 23 years after the World War II ended, Navajo Code was declassified. And only after 1968, then we were allowed to tell people what we did, like I'm telling you now. Of course, at the beginning, it was pretty hard to remember because we just decided to forget all about it. All we did was be a radio man. But after the code was declassified 23 years later, why 23 years later? Because the code was so good. The only military code, like I said, in modern history, never broken by an enemy. They were saving the code in case there was another country that was breaking codes. They would resort back to Navajo code. But all the enemy we had, like Koreans, Vietnamese, and others, we're not breaking codes. So Navajo code just remained top secret. Eventually, after 23 years, I guess, the government decided to uh, just leave it alone. That's sort of a, the history of Navajo code. Why it was needed, how it was conceived, how it was developed, how it was tested, and how it was organized to be used in every landing in the Pacific, from Guadalcanal to Okinawa, 
and into North China. Over a dozen Navajo code talkers were killed in action. About two dozen more wounded in action. Out of the 420 that were certified as Navajo code talkers, there's only nine of us still alive today. The oldest one that's still alive today is 97 years old, Fleming Begay. He went in late 1942. He served on the Battle of Tarawa, survived that battle. His next battle was Saipan. He survived that battle. His third battle was Tinian. He got shot up real badly. So they have to fly his body back to stateside San Francisco Naval Hospital where they put him back together. They must have done a super job because he's still alive at 97. <laughs> the youngest of the nine that's still alive is 90 years old. That's me. <laughs> the youngest only because I joined when I was 15 years old. Yes, I lied about my age. It happened in sequences. I had a clan cousin. We lived right next to each other. His family had their own livestock. We have two. When our livestock settled down, start grazing real nicely, we would get together and play race our donkeys, what have you, or press the shooting, 22 rifle. He went in, in early 1943. He was older than I was. After two landings, he was given a furlough to come home. And when he did come home, he was dressed in that beautiful Marine Corps blue uniform. I asked Tom, hey Tom, how do I get one of those uniforms? He said, join the Marines. I said, I want to do that. He looks at me and said, how old are you? I said, I'm 15. He said, uh-uh. You can't join Marines unless you're 17 years old. I said, well, they don't know. <laughs> well, Tom said, Whatever you do, if you're going to join Marines, you've got to tell them you're 17 years old. So, before he went back, I went to the United States Marine Corps recruiting office in Farmington, New Mexico. I told the recruiter, I want to join the Marines. He looks at me and says, how old are you? I said, I'm 17 years old. Where's your birth certificate? I said, I don't have one. I was born out in the boondocks, not a hospital. There's no record. Well, somebody has to vouch for you, he said. I said, here, this is my plant cousin. He knows I'm 17 years old. <laughs> so Tom signed a piece of paper. That's how I joined the United States Marine, went for a physical exam in San, San Santa Fe, New Mexico. They told me I can't go because I have tuberculosis. They say you better go see a doctor, go to the hospital. So I feel okay. I wasn't hurting anywhere. So I thought, to heck with that. I'm not going to go to the hospital. I don't have any pain, nothing. So I just found a job. Six months later, I got a letter from Uncle Sam saying, hey, have you been to the hospital? We want your physical exam again. 
Well, I never went to the hospital. So I tell myself, hey, why do they want me? I have tuberculosis, I can't go. Two months later, I got a big nasty letter from Uncle Sam, <laughs> saying if you don't show up for physical, we're going to come after you and put you in jail. So I showed it to my boss. He tells me, you better go. <laughs> so I, I said, look, I've already been there. I was rejected. I supposed to have tuberculosis, and I never went to the hospital, so I still have it, I'm sure. Well, went back to Santa Fe. Went through physical. And they said, I pass. I said, wait a minute. I was here over six months ago. You told me I had tuberculosis and you told me to go to the hospital. I never did. How could I be cured? Then they stopped. They put me up at a hotel right there in Santa Fe. They said, wait. A day and a half later, I was called back in. Took some more physical exam. They said, you don't have tuberculosis. What's the problem? They told me that the first time, eight months ago, my x-ray was mixed up with another guy. The guy that had tuberculosis was in Fort Bliss, Texas. And I got his x-ray. That's why they thought I had tuberculosis, but I didn't. So, at this point, they normally give someone two weeks to straighten things up at home before you go in. They won't let me do it. They said, you have eight months out there. So they put me on a train to San Diego, join the Marines at age 15. So that's the story. But the sad story is, my clan cousin Tom, after the Battle of Guam, the next battle was Peleliu. Peleliu is a real bad island. September 15, 1944, 8.30 in the morning, First Marine Division landed on the beach of Palalu. My cousin, Tom, was one of them. They always assigned every landing about a dozen Navajo code talkers to land with the first wave, the first ones to hit the beach. Why? Because the command ship the admirals and the generals want to know as soon as you hit the beach what the casualty rate is on the beach. You don't want the enemy to know how horrible it is. So, messages like that is sent back to the command ship in Navajo Code. That's why they put about a dozen Navajo Code talkers to land with the first wave to start sending messages back in Navajo code regarding casualty rates on the beach. They also want to know where the enemy fire are coming from. They tell us, as soon as you hit the beach, run like hell, hit the deck, and find out where the enemy fire is coming from. They give us a map of the island with grid lines, with numbers on them. So. They tell us, as soon as you hit the deck, run like hell, hit the deck, and find out where they are. The enemy fire is coming from. Look at your map. Send that information back to the command ship in Navajo code. Then they also assign someone, either a battleship, a cruiser, or a marine air wing, to go and knock out that particular enemy gun position. You don't want to send that message in English code, because enemies breaking codes. So they know they are being targeted, so they move their gun position. By the time it is ordered to get that position knocked out, they're moved. They're not there anymore. That's why Navajo code is used to send messages like that back to the command ship. 
They also want to know what the ammunition situation is on the beach. They want that back in Navajo. Sometime. The ammunition ship's supposed to come in about third or fourth wave to dump the ammunition on the beach for us. But sometimes they get blown up, so you're sitting there on the beach with little or no ammunition. You don't want the enemy to know that either. So that kind of situation is, is sent back to the command ship in Navajo Coast. They then load up another ammunition ship to come in, dump more ammunition. All we land with is what we have in our rifle, maybe four or five hand grenades, and also what we have in our belt. That doesn't last very long. So, messages like that is important. That's why they assign at least a dozen Navajo code topics to land with the first wave. So on Palaloo, September 15, 1944, 8.30 in the morning, the sky was clear. Temperature on the beach at 8.30, 100 degrees. At high noon, the temperature climbed to 115 degrees. Well, the first wave hit the beach. Tom and another code talker, Jimmy King, they were working together. The radio that they were using was TBX. TBX is a huge radio. One guy carries the transmitter and receiver, weighs about 30 pounds. The other guy carries the generator that weighs about 30 pounds too. You crank that generator to generate electricity to operate the receiver and transmitter. So two code talkers operate this one radio. So Tom, my cousin, and the other Navajo code talker, Jimmy King, were working together. When the first wave hit the beach, the gate opened up. All the Marines in the first wave ran out of the landing craft. Enemy machine gun opened up on all of them. Jimmy King and Tom took about 15 steps from the landing craft on the beach. Machine gun bullets went across Tom right through here. His head fell off. His body fell forward. Blood, about 12 feet from Jimmy King. That's war. War is ugly. War is bad. Yet we will continue to send our young kids to defend us, even to this day. These handsome, good-looking young men and women, we sent them overseas somewhere right now, this very hour, carrying weapons. Why? Why do we do that? Because we love this country. We don't want the ugliness of war to ever be seen and felt by our parents, relatives. That's why. We do that. The nine of us old Navajo code talkers, we get together now and then. Fleming Begay, 97 years old, always say, are we in any war? If it is, 
I want to pick up my rifle and go defend this country again. That's all this is. That's patriotism. Why? Why would you want to do that? As I said, because we love this country. Some people even say, hey, you Native American, why do you do this? This is not your war. This is white people's war. We don't look at it that way. This is our country. America. We want to defend it. Just like everyone else. War. It's tough. I wish we could all find a better way to live together in peace and harmony without killing each other. But for the past thousand years, we haven't found that solution. But that does not mean we should quit seeking a solution that will make us live together in peace and harmony without killing each other. Yes, war is bad. War is ugly. Jimmy King, he survived after the war. He and I would cry. Jimmy lived, but he was sad. That's, as I said, what we call war. Well, Navajo Code was a very unique World War II legacy. And the nine of us that are still alive, we have a project. Our project before all of us are gone from this earth. We like to build National Navajo Code Talker Museum. Why? Because what we did as Navajo Code Talkers, this unique legacy of World War II need to be preserved. Thank you. We need to preserve it because what we did truly represents who we are as Americans. We all know America is comprised of a diverse community. We say that. We see it in print. America is a diverse community. Different skills, different talents, different nationalities, different languages. So what we did as Navajo Code Talkers truly represents who we are as Americans. That's why we want to preserve it for our kids and our grandkids. Your kids, your grandkids, all of our kids and grandkids should go through the museum after we are all gone. We also made a calculation that we lose at least three Navajo Code Talkers every year. Last year there was 12 of us around this time. Today there's only nine. For sure, next year this time there'll only be six. Before long, none of us will be here to tell you what I'm telling you. But we like our kids 
the future generation, your kids and our kids, your grandkids and our grandkids, to go through that museum and really learn who we are as America, Americans. We are diverse, yes. Different skills, different talents, different nationality, different languages. But when our way of life is threatened, when things that we cherish most, like our freedom and liberty, we all come together as one. And when we become one, we cannot be defeated. We are invincible. That's why we truly believe a museum is important. Chevron Oil Company donated 245 acres of private land to us Navajo Code Talkers and said, here, this land is yours. Build your museum on this land. So we have land, 245 acres. We have architects and engineers working on that land, see how we could develop it to put a museum as well as other businesses to support the museum. We have the land, we have architects working on it, but we need money. So if you have a rich uncle <laughs> somewhere, Tell them we have a museum to build for our kids and grandkids. Something they all and all of us should know who we are as Americans. That's why I'm here talking to you about Navajo Coat Talker Museum as well. You know, <clears throat> one other thing. I'm wearing a yellow shirt. You probably wonder why. After the code was declassified in 1968, people began to come at us. You were code talker? Yes. Tell me this, tell me that. Well, there was too many requests like that. So we decided back in those days, back in the 60s and early 70s, there was at least 300 of us or more still alive. So we organized Navajo Code Talker Association, like VFW. So we asked ourselves, what shall our uniform be like as Navajo Code Talkers to identify ourselves? After a lot of discussion, suggestion was made, yellow shirt. Let's wear a yellow shirt to show we were code talkers. Why? yellow shirt because we took with us overseas yellow corn pollen in the buckskin bag like this. This is a short one. This, I care this for personal use. But the one we took overseas had, had a longer buckskin bag about that long, full of corn pollen. Before we went overseas, a medicine man, Navajo medicine man, blessed the corn pollen and told us, take this with you into battle. When you get into a real tough situation, use this corn pollen, asking for protection. When you're down in a foxhole, with bullets flying five, ten inches over your head, motor shells being dropped everywhere. Looks like you're not going to be there for another minute. You take this corn pollen, usually when you go into bed, you tie this to your dog tag. When you're hunkering down in a foxhole, not knowing how long you're going to be there before you get blown up, you untie this from your dog tag, open it up, Take a pinch of it, put it on your tongue. Take another pinch, put it on top of your head. Take another one, make an offering, asking for help and protection. Of course, down 
in the foxhole. The other network guy is with you. The English network guy, the blonde haired kid. He would do this, hey chief, what are you doing? I'm asking for help and protection. He would say, may I have some? <laughs> so he let him have some, he does it too. That's what the yellow shirt represent. Yellow corn pollen that we took overseas with us, blessed by a Navajo medicine man. Turquoise necklace. Turquoise is a sacred stone for Navajo. A red cap. We are very proud to have served United States Marines. Khaki pants, representing Mother Earth. Code word for Mother America. Nihimah. Nihimah in Navajo means our mother. That was the code word for America. So, every August 14, from 1940, 1982, we dress like this on August 14 of each year. Why? Because President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, declared August 14 to be National Navajo Code Talker Day. Approved. approved by joint congressional resolution to confirm August 14 to be National Navajo Court Talker Day. We always wonder why August 14. We finally were told that August 14 is the official ending of World War II. That's why that day, a special day, is also Navajo Code Talker Day because the code that was used actually happened the war. 2001, Congress and President of the United States asked us to come to Washington, D.C., those of us that were still alive. In their rotunda set Senators and congressmen, President of the United States, George Bush. We were there to be honored. President of the United States, George Bush, presented to the Navajo Code Talkers the nation's highest medal, Congressional Gold and Silver Medal, to say thank you to the Navajo Nation for the language that was used. So, on August 14, every year we dress like this, celebrate our Navajo Nation. Sometime later on, state of Arizona and state of New Mexico adopted that same day as state Navajo Code Talker Day. So New Mexico, Arizona, and Navajo Nation, we all come together on August 14 and celebrate Navajo Code Talker Day. That's the story that I have for you tonight. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Anyone have a question? Oh yes, before the question, I might also add, you see there are some books over here. There are several books, over a dozen books about Navajo Code Talkers. They have all different titles. They're all good books. This one is called Navajo Weapon. Indeed, Navajo Code was a weapon. I like that book because they're all good books, as I said. This one here, the author did a great deal of research into the matter. So, it tells you why the code was needed, how it was developed, how it was tested, 
and how it was used in different landings. Also, in this book, you will find at least 90% of all code words developed and used in the Pacific. Like the code word for the letter J. <laughs> and many others, all in there. They're for sale. And my daughter is sitting right there. Her name is Charity. She'll help you if you want to buy one of those. She can help you with it. But you will find all those code words in there. My suggestion is buy the book in the comfort of your home, by your fireplace. But learn what the code words represent. Set, I will also include my email address. When you get comfortable with it, send me an email using Navajo code words. <laughs> Only you and I would understand what we're talking about. All these hackers breaking into your messages will never break the Navajo code. I have here, uh, I, I, there's a, this room is full of standing room only. I don't know, I have enough, but my daughter and I discuss this. Look, we don't only have a, just a handful of books here. I want to receive email from every one of these people. So she suggested if you give her your name, address, when we get home, we start mailing them out to you. So those of you who are not able to get one of the books can get it in the mail within three or four days after we get home. It's there. Also, there's a postcard, some of it, a picture of myself dressed like this. And I'll, I'll autograph it, personally autograph it for you, the books and the photo. That's what we have here this evening. So whenever we finish here, just get around that side, come up here. We'll do the military style, just get in line. <laughs> and also, go ahead with the question. <laughs> The location for the museum, it's going to be just east of Navajo Nation Capital, Window Rock, Arizona. Navajo Nation Capital is right on New Mexico and Arizona state line. So this museum, the property that was given to us by Chevron, is on the New Mexico side, about 20 miles northwest of Gallup, New Mexico. I, Interstate I-40 runs through Gallup, New Mexico, so it's only about 25 miles north of I-40. Any other question? Yes. I, my hair is shot. <laughs> she wants to know about numbers. Numbers, one, two, three, four, and come. Number was the same. Sai, na, ki, tra, di, ashtra, one, two, three, four, five. So numbers were the same. Yes. Were you on Iwo Jima? No, I was not on Iwo. 
I was with the 6th Marine Division up in North China. Yes. Uh, sir, I'm sure that after the initial 29 of you uh, developed your initial code, that uh, additional words were needed. After you developed, how did you develop uh, words that you hadn't developed initially, and how did you disseminate those through the rest of the uh, uh, code talkers? Uh, as I said, Initially, 260 code words were developed by the first group, memorized. After that, more code words were needed and developed. And any new code words that are developed is disseminated to code talkers that are already overseas in South Pacific. They are sent to a specific island. And that's where they come together and new code words is disseminated to them and memorize so we could all be on the same page at all time. Thanks, sir. Any other? Frank. Yes. Oh. What rank did you hold? What rank did you hold? What was your rank? What rank? The rank was, my rank was corporal. All of us that were code talkers, we can go only go up to corporal. Why? We asked the question after the war. They told us that if we were elevated to sergeant or higher rating, we have different responsibility. They want us only to have communication responsibility. So we can only go up to corporal. That's all. That's what they told us. So every one of us came up private, private first class, and corporal, and everything stops there. Sir? Sir? Yes. Sir, did you see the movie Wind Talker? And how much was Hollywood, and how much was what you lived through? He's asking about Wind Talkers. A movie. Uh, a movie was made of Navajo code talkers. MGM came to the Navajo Nation in the year 2000 asking all kinds of questions about what we did as code talkers. At that time, there were still about 300 of us still alive. We gave them everything. At the opening of the movie, after it was finished, MGM invited us to the opening. We saw the movie. The movie was good, a good war movies. If you love war movies, you mean shoot them up and all out of killing. Of the entire movie, only 10% was regarded Navajo Code Talkers. 90% was about Nicolas Cage and his problem, whatever that was. We need a good movie like what I'm telling you. Thank you. Why was the Navajo language better than the other native language? Uh, the question was why Navajo language as opposed to other tribal languages? That was discussed. If you read that book, it'll tell you. Correspondence back and forth between the United States Marine Corps, Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, there was a lot of communication that went on as to what tribe could be used after suggestion was made by Philip Johnson to use Navajo. But Marines and others say, why not use some other tribe or language? So they did, they look into it, and they discovered that Navajo language was the only one that very few people knew the language, number one. 
Number two, because there's going to be attrition. Navajo tribe was the largest than any other tribe. So Navajo is, if Navajo language is used, if some more and more Navajos are killed in action, there's more to replace them with learning the same code. So that book at least says that, that that's the, some of the decision that went into selecting Navajo language as a code. Was it just in the Pacific, or was it was it in the Pacific? Okay. Was it in the Pacific or Europe? Why wasn't it used in Europe? The code, the Navajo code, it was in Pacific only. Not yes, the Navajo code was used in the Pacific only. The uh, request was made of the United States Army in Europe if they needed a code. If so. Navajo code was available. The response back from the army in Europe was no. The Japanese, I mean the Germans were not breaking codes. So they didn't need a Navajo code. Thank you very much. Oh, one more. Yes, uh, there's been a lot of over the years documentary and research and code breaking on both sides. Was there any interrogation of Japanese after the war as to why they couldn't break the Navajo code? He's asking about any Navajos that were interrogated. Huh? Any Navajos that were interrogated. Uh, there were several Navajo code talkers taken prisoners in the early part of the war, like on Guadalcanal, Bougainville, Cape Plaster. Tarwa, but they were not taken prison by Japanese. These Navajo code talkers were taken prison by United States Marines, <laughs> thinking that we were Japanese masquerading a Marine Corps <laughs> uniform. They stick a bayonet in the back of these guys, take them down where they keep the Japanese tell them to strip down. Of course, we can't say we're code talkers. We just say we're one of the Marines. And they say, yeah, that's what all the Japanese say. <laughs> and they, when they, a Marine Corps soldier is killed, Japanese take the dog tag from that Marine, their clothes, put it on, and try to pretend that they were United States Marines. They know that. So since we're there, same color, same height, they mistake us for Japanese, take us down to where they keep the Japanese prisoners, make a strip, and they, these poor guys have to tell these guys, hey, wait, I'm now States Marine. They say, no, they all say that. No, go call Colonel so-and-so. Any battle landing, we always report to a colonel, a specific United States Marine Corps colonel. He's the only one that knows. So we gave him the name of that colonel. He comes over, recognizes, saying to these two guards that brought him in, that's a United States Marine, Get, give his clothes back to him. <laughs> and the colonel was saying, the next time you do that, I'm going to put you in here. So they eventually got smart and have a blonde-haired Marine to be with us at all times. <laughs> that eliminated any more taken prisoners. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know you whole bunch of you are in line here. Thank you, have a good evening.
right, as we said before, if you're interested in his book or a uh, postcard, please form a line over here on the, against the wall, so come up on this side, and then you can exit this side. Thank you, everyone, for coming.